Welcome everybody, uh, in-person audience and remote audience. My name is Ana Cândida Carneiro. I use she, her, or ela pronouns. And I am a Latin American woman with brown hair, fair uh, skin, and I'm now standing uh, by a round table, by a, a square table <laughs> or a rectangular table. <laughs> I, am, uh, I am an assistant professor in playwriting uh, and, uh, and I'm head of the MFA in Playwriting program at IU Bloomington, where, where we are streaming from now. This uh, live streamed event is part of the At First Sight Festival of New Plays 2023 at in Indiana University Bloomington, which features new works by our MFA playwrights uh, and other events. The festival is curated by me with playwriting and dramaturgy graduate students. Uh, tonight, uh, or this afternoon, uh, we have here with us three incredible guests. Um, Bradley Mikalakis, literary manager at Ali Theatre Houston. Celisa Kalke, managing director uh, at Synchronicity Theatre Atlanta. And Martin uh, Green Rogers, dean at DePaul University. Uh, and I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna kindly ask our uh, playwrights and dramaturgs to introduce the guests now. Hello, my name is Annalise Kane and I'm one of the MFA playwrights. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I am a white woman with reddish hair and I'm currently sitting at the table and I'm going to introduce Bradley. So Bradley Michalakis is a dramaturg and theater producer from New York. He is currently the literary manager at Alley Theater in Houston, where he helps to develop new plays through the annual Alley All New Festival. Recent work in Houston includes world premiere productions of Cowboy Bob, What a Christmas, and Ken Ludwig's Lend Me a Soprano. Before locating to Houston, Bradley worked as the director of literary development at the Foxborough Company, the Broadway production office behind John Leguzmano's uh, Latin History for Morons, uh, and the recent revival of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide slash When the Rainbow is Enough. Bradley's work has been featured at Delaware Rep, Delaware Shakespeare Festival, and Theater for a New Audience. In addition to his work in theater, Bradley has produced live music events in NYC since 2016. Hello, my name is Lexi Silva. I am a third year MFA dramaturgy candidate here at Indiana University, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a Portuguese and Palestinian American woman with light brown hair and brown eyes. I'm here to introduce Salisa Kalki, who is a dramaturg whose career has taken place in some of America's most exciting and rigorous theaters. She began her American career at the Juilliard School in New York, worked also at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and has had an artistic affiliation with independent art here. She was the resident dramaturg at Court Theatre in Chicago and the director of the literary department at the Public Theatre. She lived in Atlanta working at the Alliance Theatre since 2005 and since 2018 has been the managing director of Synchronicity Theatre. Salise has a teaching association with Actors Express in Atlanta and was an associate artist at Next Theatre in Chicago working with Jason Lewitt. In the 1990s, she lived in Prague, the Czech Republic, was a member of Misery Loves Company at, Czech, at a Czech English company, and worked with the Narondi Diavolo and Diavolo Pod Palmovku while a student at DAMU, the Prague Theatre Academy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm David Davila. Uh, my pronouns are all pronouns, and I am a Latino American, scruffy, gay, jolly. Many would say I'm jolly. Uh, uh, my grinder profile says rugged, if that helps. Got a beard. Uh, <laughs> and I am a playwright here uh, in the festival and at school. Um, I'm here to introduce Martine Key Green Rogers, who is the Dean of the Theater School at DePaul University. She obtained her PhD from the Department of Theater and Drama at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to studying at UW-Madison, she received her BA in theater from Virginia Wesleyan College and her MA in theater history and criticism from the Catholic University of America. Her dramaturgical productions include Tony Stone and Sweat, at the Goodman, oh, I saw that one. King Hedley II, Radio Golf, 
Five guys named Mo. Blues for an Alabama sky. Gem of the ocean. Waiting for Godot. Ifinhia in Aulis, Seven Guitars, The Mountaintop, Home, and Porgy and Bess at the Court Theater in Chicago, Illinois. Hairspray, The Book of Will Shakespeare, oh, The Book of Will, Shakespeare in Love, <laughs> The Comedy of Errors, To Kill a Mockingbird, The African Company Presents Richard III, A Midsummer's Night's Dream, and Fences at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. She was also part of the dramaturgical team for the remount of Jagged Little Pill on Broadway, which is coming here in just a couple of weeks. She is the stage adapter of Jason Reynolds' book, Long Way Down, which premiered at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in October of 2018. Her publications include the article, Talkbacks for Sensitive Subject Matters, Productions, The Theory and Practice in the Rutledge Companion to Dramaturgy, co-author on A New Noble Kingsman, The Play On Project, and Making New Plays Out of Old in Theater History Studies, co-author on Visual Dramaturgy, Problem Solver, or Problem Maker in Contemporary Performance Creation in Theater Practice, and co-author on Continuing the Conversation, Responses to Gabriela Serena Sanchez and Kira Alegria Hoods in Theater Topics. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So today we're going to talk about best practices in new play development with a particular focus on anti-racism and anti-oppression uh, practices. So uh, I'm going to be moderating the discussion, but I will encourage it to make it very fluid uh, so that folks can jump in and ask questions. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll start maybe you know, to just jump start the conversation, I would like to maybe ask you to uh, to tell us a bit uh, a bit about your journey in new play development, and maybe you know uh, sharing the highlights and the things that most uh, excite you about that. Thank you. As er, as as my very long bio states. My <laughs> <laughs> my name is Martine Key Green Rogers. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a black woman with freckles in her 40s, but if you step, take several steps back, I might look like I'm in my 20s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm wearing glasses, a gray dress, and I have short, coily, curly black hair. So to, I'm guessing, should we introduce ourselves and then answer the question, or just go ahead and start? All right, well, then I'm... Hey everyone, um, I'm Bradley Mikalakis. Um, I am a half Greek, half Latino man in my late 20s. I'm wearing a blue vest and a blue shirt and a blue watch, so I realize I'm like kind of like Violet Beauregarding <laughs> it right now. <laughs> um, uh, and I have fair skin and dark hair, and yeah, um, happy to be here. Um, hi, my name is Salisa Kalki, um, and um, I've never been on one of these panels when I'm the old guard, but I am the old guard. It's weird. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, and uh, I had, I'm um, about 5'8 and uh, light skin and hair. And um, I always wear black because I'm hiding my secret grinder identity <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a soccer mom. <laughs> now, my kid actually doesn't play soccer, but I spend a lot of time parenting now these days. Um, uh, so I, ch I, I wear a lot of black, so I try to look cool. Can you repeat the question again? <laughs> well, it's basically our journey in new play oh, development, so the highlights. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like for me, and this is Martine again, uh, for me, my journey was a, a little a, a little bit of a long time coming in that my background is in the classics. And so for a while, that was basically where I lived and had fun being like that black girl who was doing the classics. But... Um, my, my journey into new play development actually happened during my PhD program where there was, uh, in Madison, there was a new play festival that was happening. And so I kinda, they needed a dramaturg and they were like, oh, Martine, you do that thing, even though you don't do that thing in this particular way. So come do that thing that you do over there. <laughs> come do that over here. And so uh, that is where it started. But then I also discovered that there is a pure, genuine joy that I get in helping uh playwrights write the best play that they can write and so I'm gonna own I started chasing that a little bit I was like ooh, there's joy in that I'm gonna go keep chasing that joy and so in terms of the highlights you know that has led me to 
working at places like Great Plains Theater Commons. And I was, uh, I forget what my official title was, don't tell anybody, <laughs> as I say that on something that's being live streamed. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, I had a title at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis up until like May, uh, March of last year, um, and basically my job there was to help with uh, help basically be the personal dramaturg for all the many of the fellow the playwrights who were there on fellowship and like the Mini Voices fellows etc. And just lots of other really fun places. I'm a reader for quite a few places, um, and you know it's just something that I have pure joy in doing. Hey Bradley here. Um, I guess for me, new play development um, came up as sort of a necessity in a weird way because I never studied theater or planned to go into theater really as a career, but it was something that I always loved and wanted to do. So while I was in school pursuing something completely different, which is now proven totally useless <laughs> and not part of my life at all, um, when I was not there, I would... I wanted to continue doing theater and so I'm from New York and every you know when I would go back over the summers or whatever I would work with my friends who were all involved with theater too and we would produce our own work um, just because we had no other outlet for doing that so I mean we did some classics too like we did a couple of Shakespeare plays whatever but it became much more centered around producing my friends and and people collaborators I meet in New York like their new plays so we would do I mean, you know, in the craziest, weirdest venues, warehouse spaces, abandoned theater spaces that were, like, owned by hoarders where there were, like, literally rats running around. Like, horrible places. But um, it was a great place to learn how to do that process. Um, and then as I started to segue into working at theater institutions and working in regional theater and then eventually commercial theater in New York, um, it became obvious that, you know, generally speaking in this country – people who see theater and are excited by theater tend to be of an older generation. And when you look around audiences, that's what you see. And as somebody in my generation, I feel concerned about how, what work are we doing to bring new audiences in? What are we intentionally presenting to create more excitement about this? And so developing new work seemed to be a natural part of answering that question. And so I was very lucky to find, um, the Alley Theater, which I've known about for years, and, and it's a great theater. But what's so great about it and what attracted me there is that they put such a huge emphasis on new work, and we do world premieres, like almost half our shows this season are world premieres, and we do a new play festival at the end of each season. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just become kind of my, my main thing. It's fun. Um, hi, this is Talisa. Um, so I grew up in classical music, which if you know classical music, you literally grow up in it. And, um, and then when I was at a conservatory, like I, I, I love to talk um, and I'm really opinionated. And uh, a classical music conservatory, you get to be a bad girl really fast <laughs> if, you, if you love to talk. And a couple letters to the dean, like I don't understand why a modern uh, music concert that is filled with the work by men is modern music, but a modern music concert that is full of the work by women is an exception. And, <laughs> and then when the dean stops talking to you after you write that letter, um, there's a little lifestyle conversation you have to have with yourself about how you want to spend your years. Um, and fortunately, I didn't, wasn't working in theater, so I didn't know that all these same issues were there, right? So I read Angels in America, and I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. Sign me up. And then I moved to Prague, and I got all my theater training <laughs> because I learned how to say I have a big theater background, and I want to be a dramaturg in Czech before I had <laughs> any theater background. Um, <laughs> so, you know, then I had to do it. Um, so uh, I actually, um, I mean, because Angels in America, because I fell in love with Angels in America, and I thought that's what American theater is, I, I, well, I can't. I don't I don't know how we're keeping this conversation, but but there are also these amazing theater artists like Garland Wright at the Guthrie um, who are doing classical dramaturgy. I'm classical music. So in my fake it till you make it way of building a career, I just was like classical dramaturgy. That's what I do. Um, and that that was not crazy, actually. Um, and then the I had some Czech theater artists who actually trained me how very quickly how to be a, 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 a real dramaturg. They were in incredible. I was in like Czech theater boot camp for three years. And then um, I moved to New York and I wrote a letter to the public theater saying, hi, I do Shakespeare, so I should be an intern here. Mm. And, um, 
and they got me an interview that got me an interview because of the check credits um and shelby jiggets who's one of the who's an incredible um dramaturg and uh one of one of like the the uh pioneers and trailblazers in um in uh um in dramaturgy and George C. Wolf, who's like a genius, um, both said, "No, you don't do classical music. You do you don't do classical dramaturgy. You do new play development." And um, and I just do whatever George C. Wolf tells me to <laughs> do. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's how that's how I got involved in um, in uh, new yeah I yeah in new play in development. And I I got to work with George. Um, you know, literally doing everything, you know, whatever George told me to do for um, a couple years. And George was behind the move to Atlanta. So, like, George said Atlanta was interesting, so I moved to Atlanta. Really, like, any time I have a life decision, I see if George will still answer my emails. <laughs> Hi, Anna again. Um, so, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think uh, I'd like to go into the process now and maybe ask you what what are how, what is your own process when you when you dramaturg and you pl play? What are the things you pay attention at, at? What you would recommend to new dramaturgs to observe as best practices, uh, or or how your institution does it? So I wanted to start because I don't do it anymore. Um, and I won't, I, I really won't be a dramaturg for an institution anymore. I just won't do it. Um, yeah, I, that I, I did it. I did it for a really long time. So now if you get me, you get me. Like that's, that's the deal. But um, when I was an institutional dramaturg, um, my first rule was never, ever, 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 ever. Like it will, it, like you can rip my nails out. I won't do it. I won't give a playwright a note on the behalf of the institution until I've fed them. So I had a company, like, won't do it. And then I also have to give them presents. And then I see how we are. I see how we're doing. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is particularly, and this is very much thinking about, ins like, institutional dramaturgy, because that seems to be sort of where we're headed, not just me working with a playwright, which is a different thing. But representing the institution, there's a certain element of, I'm the one person in this institution who will be with you through your crazy. And in the course of this meal that we're having, we're going to kind of figure out what, what the, we're going to figure out together what the deal is. But that that building of solidarity, um, so that your office is a safe space, is like really, really, really key. Hello, Bradley. Um, I completely agree with what Salisa said. I think. Um, for me, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's about relationship building. It's about making people feel comfortable. It's about making writers feel like you are listening to them and fundamentally that you are in service of their work, not trying to impose your own thoughts and ideas on it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of dramaturgs also are writers or have ideas or, or whatever, but it's that's a completely separate part of the equation. It's just more of like a filtration process and helping to clarify and taking the time to understand really fundamentally what they're trying to do with a piece before you start stepping in and trying to change a piece. Um, yeah. This is Martine. Uh, so I think in terms of my process for new play dramaturgy, it depends on the genre and where we are in process. So for example, what my process looks like on a new musical is very different than what my process looks like on a straight play, which is different than if I'm, I also am one of those weird dramaturgs that starts to venture out in other places, like I do some music turgy, mm. things like that. And so depending on what those things are, but in, if I had to give like this sort of short version of what that looks like, I think, especially when it's just, my favorite part of the process is always when it's just me and the playwright. Mm. And part of the reason why is because it, that is the time where you can do sort of what uh, Bradley was just talking about, which is asking the questions like, wh wh where do you where do you see your play? What what do you think needs to happen next? Where where do you feel like? What questions do you have? Like, how can I be that person that you can just bounce ideas off of before anyone else has to get involved? And when I say has to get involved, we already know that if it's been commissioned, there are a whole bunch of a host of producers already 
already involved. But before, it has to be something that has to be given over to them to pass judgment on. Like, wh- what are the things that you see? What do you want to work on? What is What are those things? And then I think also in terms, so in that process for me, just to get granular, granular for a second, is really asking those questions. And it's the brilliant sort of back and forth and like setting up that schedule and saying, okay, I'm going to, do you need me to be that dramaturg that like checks in on you every once in a while to be like, hey, how are those rewrites going? Or do you need me to be that dramaturg that just sort of slinks away into the dust until you like show back up magically in my emails? And, you know, how active do you want to be? And like all those sort of building of relationship and a friendship that then allows for the later things that. Uh, Salisa was just talking about in terms of being that person that's also now your mama turd when that thing finally gets to production. Oh, I have all kinds of portmanteaus for drama turd. Just know it's, you're going to hear a lot of them over the course of this conversation. <laughs> and 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 th- But then also, like, what does it look like in production? And I feel like part of what happens when you get to production is that it's about holding a hand. And, like, not even necessarily, like, physically holding the hand, but really just being there to be like, look, you ha- like if no one else in this room is feeling this play, I am here and I'm your best supporter and I'm going to act like I've lost my mind the moment the curtain comes down uh, after that first, you know, after that first preview, like I am that person for you. So just tell me what you need me to be and I will be flexible and be that. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, it's like emotional support dramaturgy at a certain <laughs> point, um, for sure. And, you know, in... Therapy turgy. Therapy turgy, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's also important, like, in an institutional setting, there's a, I mean, it's not just about the play itself and making that as good as possible, but it's also bridging the gap between an artist and an institution that has its own systems and beliefs and ways of working. And it's just about making that process as comfortable and easy as possible for, for people so the artist can just do the work and not worry about that stuff. There's, at least for me, I don't know other people's experience, but there's a certain like aspect of kind of being a line producer associated with being a dramaturg, especially if it's in production. Um. Yeah, I think, and I think what the three of us share is there are dramaturgs who, like, I'm having so much, yup, yup, yup. <laughs> but there, there are some dramaturgs who are not good line producers. Mm-hmm. And there are some dramaturgs who are not good, uh, who don't like being in institutions. And I think what is great about the curating of this panel is we all dig it. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially right now, with so many reckonings, especially the the We See You White American Theater and the racial reckoning that's going on and on really hard conversations about best practices. That's a really tricky place to be. And I will say, <laughs> dramaturgs are never the highest paid person in the theater. So, you know, you're really spending a lot of time advocating while you're like, I don't know, can I afford the expensive peanut butter this month? Mm-hmm. Right, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a tricky thing. Um, I would say, you know, the... Like there been ta- there was w- there's one really <laughs> exciting moment in my professional life where the playwright and I were actually communicating telepathically. Like I joke mm-hmm. that that will happen, but this was at because one of us had to take over a rehearsal and we were watching a process implode before our eyes, and we were sitting we'd we screwed up and we thought that the the director would feel more supported if we were at opposite sides of the room, like sending, mm. like sending, come on one more day, you've got it. Um, but this director did not have it, and they, they were kind of mad at the cast, and, and the, the play was going down. And um, the playwright and I had this incredible telepathic exchange that went something like, it's your play, you take over. It's your theater, you take over. No, 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 it's your play. You got us into this mess. Yeah. You take over. <laughs> You're the one who asked me to do produce the play at your theater, <laughs> Missy. Um, you take over. No, you take over. And finally, the playwright went, because he was like, you are both – more employed and older than I am, go. And I was like, okay. And then, um, but like, there were no, th- we weren't even looking at each other. And later we were like, oh yeah, no, no, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, it was, yeah, because like our child was threatened. It was like being a parent. It's like, well, it isn't like being a parent because you are not the parent, but um, but you are in it. You are, and when it's good, you are in it with the writer. And if you're, if things are cooking, that you're being in it with the writer is wonderful for everyone else. Like you being in it with the writer is great. It raises money and helps marketing and raises group sales and makes the writer really happy and creates a great opening night dinner. I mean, there are all these benefits to you being in it. But if the chips are down, <laughs> you being in it means the writer is going to have a great product and emerge from this experience still excited about making theater, which is also, I think, a goal, right? Like don't, don't let a career go go down. Mm. 
on your watch. This is Martine again. Uh, I want to also pull a little bit of the question that you asked earlier about, uh, you know, sort of fostering and shepherding new dramaturgs into the fold a little bit. So part of where this is coming from, th this answer is coming from my track as an educator. And so obviously sort of bringing new dramaturgs into the fold by virtue of educating them. And then also, you know, as a past president of LMDA and really sort of I put a lot of time during my tenure as president of LMDA really thinking about how are we fostering both um, – you know, equally early career, mid career, and late career dramaturgs, so they're of equal importance. But one of the things that I was thinking about is that for me, like, especially as an educator, we can theorize about what dramaturgy is all day long in a classroom, but you don't actually know what it is until you get in there and you do it. Like you just have to get in there and do it, which I think is sometimes some the most frightening thing that I can say to students of dramaturgy. They're like, wait, 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 wait. I got to get in there and do it. No, yes, you got to get in there and do it. And so I, I do this thing that I know probably is going to horrify some folk right now. But I have a tendency like I will purposefully bring uh, student dramaturgs into professional settings with me and then give them vest them in the in that space as much power as I have in that space. And I will do things like, unfortunately, like, hi, Camille. I know you're probably watching this. Camille <laughs> was just on me with, was with me and to on Tony Stone at the Goodman, who's one of our uh, BFA dramaturgs at DePaul. And I was like, and so I was like, just so you know, and actually I, I warned Camille. I was like, just so you know, at some point I'm going to say, Dean life is really busy. You're going to have to do it. So be ready. And then I purposefully then sat in rehearsals for a little bit and, and let Camille get comfortable. And then one day when Camille was least expecting it, I was like, bye, yeah. have fun. And it was so funny because Camille was like, what? And I was like, you got this. They will ask questions. You have been here the whole time. You know what's happening. Just do it. And then, of course, because I am a mama turg at heart, then I, si I signed into Zoom and watched what happened. <laughs> And Camille was amazing because back to like sometimes you just have to do it. And, and then the thing that was so amazing is that, that Camille came into her own in that space. Really like everyone treated her because like, back to you got to set people up for success. I already told everybody, look, one day I'm going to leave and Camille's going to be here and you're just going to have to listen to what Camille says. And I trust Camille. So you need to trust Camille as well. The end. And they did. And so, and that was the beautiful thing. So by the time that the process was over, Camille was like, oh my goodness. I feel now like I can go back into DePaul and look at the way that I do this very differently because of the fact that I've had this experience outside of this building without my peers. Cause like the other thing that we do, which I actually think is really great is that we have them do it in pairs. But I was like, one day you're not gonna have a pair and you're gonna be in that space by yourself. And what are you gonna do? And so anyway, done. <laughs> Hello, this is Anna again. Um, I wanted, I think, uh, to sort of dig into the question a little bit more. Uh, many of you have mentioned the importance of building relationships, as dramaturgy is a relational art, right? Um, and that's, uh, I think, that's where also the anti-racist and anti-oppression work comes in uh, and the difficulty of actually doing it. Um, in my experience as a, as a playwright in some new play development realities, I, I got faced with like challenges and ways of doing and ways of making uh, that would uh, more often, you know, try to cater to certain uh, aesthetics or dynamics or audiences. So I'm I'm wondering if you have thoughts or you know to share how how do we make this this these these difficult conversations uh, possible, less messy, and you know so that we can all evolve together you know as a community with diversity. This is Elisa, and this is why I'm a managing director now, like all the stuff you just said, because you know, if you're invited as a playwright into a space and your mandate from whoever's inviting you is change who you are to make and what your work is, 
to make your work more compatible to our audiences. That I think is a really, really problematic transaction unless you're really upfront about it. Like you are, you know, and I think actually um, media navigates this a lot better. Like if you're working for Disney, you know what you're doing, right? And like there's a certain transaction there. If you're going to be in, you know, if you're writing for a house brand, you or I'm thinking about Law and Order is probably a less problematic example. If you're writing for Law and Order, you're writing for Law and Order. Like there's no, you know exactly what that is. But that brand, because I know a lot of writers who've written for Law and Order, they are so specific about this is what you have to do, this is what we want you to do, and this is what you get to do. And the the get was you can do whatever topic you want, but you st- within whatever topic you want, you have to stay in the formula, and then. Artists can say, I cannot deal with that, or yeah, that sounds great, and I want the paycheck. But I think sometimes theaters are not so explicit. Um, and um, you know, seeing artists frustrated and being on the dramaturgical side of things, which is the let's all make this work and make, you know, like this is, these are the mandates, this is what we're all gonna do together. It just felt like since since I I the last couple of years that I was in the alliance I sort of felt like I had this resume like hanging around my ankle and if anyone go, you know if anyone coming right out of school googled me they were going to say it likes a list of c- credits a mile long and some of them were in check it was ridiculous you can't get away from that but um you know that will always you know you're never going to have a pure you're never you're you can have a pure relationship but it will take a lot of work and a lot of honesty and it just felt like there were some problems in the American theater that we haven't learned how to fix that are on the management transaction. How do we pay people? What kind of money do we have? What are our working conditions? What are we asking writers to do? What are we being transparent about that were more challenging? Hey, this is Bradley. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about this question. Um, first of all, Personally, I think it's a really strong myth that a lot of places operate under, which is this idea about like catering to a specific audience is what you need to do in order to stay afloat because there are audiences who crave work that are not being catered to. So even if you're trying to look at it from a business perspective, that's not the only way to approach it to keep your own audience. And then to that end, it's more about identifying who is physically around you. That's why I like working in regional theater too because it can be so much more immediate to the community that it serves as opposed to like commercial work in New York which is just catering to like a, you know, tourists and whatever, people who just happen to be there. But you can really look around and see what groups are not having their stories told and then you can find people who are telling those stories because there are amazing playwrights telling any story you could imagine. There's there's a lot of work out there. And so if you frame it in that way, there's not a need to to try to, you know, shove someone's work into a hole that it doesn't fit into. Um, and that's why I personally, I, I hate this type of work that's like, um, you know, like, oh, we're doing Shakespeare, but this is Taming the Shrew, but it's feminist or like whatever. No shade to the public, sorry. <laughs> Calling it ever, whatever. Um, uh, but beca- I, I don't like that type of work because it's like, if this is a modern story, this is a story that needs to be told. And... There are so many people who are working and alive trying to tell that story, and yet we're not giving them work in order to do a less direct version of telling that story. And to me, that that just makes no sense, and it's not healthy for the industry, it's not healthy for the writers, and it ultimately doesn't create the best output of of artwork. So, yeah, I mean, I I think that a lot of theater institutions are at varying stages of of learning and accepting this process and how open-ended it could be, and so... I feel like things generally, people are becoming more aware and moving in a good direction with this. So I'm, I'm just excited to see what good work comes out and what, you know, writers who have never had opportunities now, if they're being given them, you know, what am- amazing work can come from a writer that's never been seen before in 10 years after they've been produced a bunch of times. And, you know, when we don't have to keep referring back to these like huge names and, and whatever. And yeah. So this is terrible. This is Martine again, but this is terrible. So I didn't start writing your question down until the part where you said difficult conversations, less messy. And so would you repeat your question again? Because <laughs> I don't think I have the first half of the question. <laughs> this is Anna again. Um, uh, I asked about, um, you know, since 
dramaturgy is a relational art and in new play development is so important the relationship that the dramaturg develops with the playwright um uh, i'm wondering how do we uh you know include in this conversation relational problems that regard oppression identity uh and you know um either in a one-on-one -on -one relationship or on an institutional level are are there best practices what should be we be paying attention to <laughs> this is martin again okay so one i think the main thing that needs to happen is that institutions actually need to listen to their playwright when they are advocating for what they need in their room and what they need from their dramaturg. Like, sometimes it's actually just that simple. If someone says, I think it'd be really helpful to have someone who is either culturally specific or specific in terms of gender identity or sexual identity, listen to those things and, and find that person. And here's the, here is the dirty, dirty, not so big secret about dramaturgy. There's a bunch of us out there. <laughs> If you ask the right question, you will find the right person. And, and so I'm going to give you a really good example of this. So I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to, like, call out some folks. I'm going to see if how generally I can give this story without being weird. Or <laughs> but there, I went to an LMDA conference a long time ago where uh, we, we were having a joint conference with a, a musical theater conference. And there was a joint panel in which there were folk from the Musical Theater Conference and LMDA together. And one of the people from the musical theater side, who happens to be a musical theater writer, basically decided to go all in and talk about how awful dramaturgs are, how they ruin their play, like all this other stuff. And the thing that I am going to give, I, I love me some Beth Blickers. So we're just going to go. And Beth was moderating this panel. And Beth let this. Oh, OK. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and so Beth did the most amazing thing at, at, after this person had this little rant that they had. Uh, Beth was like, did you vet your dramaturg? And she said it in that way that Beth does that has that undertone of did I stutter? <laughs> <And> <laughs> but was like, did you vet your dramaturg? And, and the, the pl this person was like, what? Did you vet your dramaturg? And this person was like, well, what do you mean? And so then, like, Beth goes through this exercise with us and says, everyone who is in this space who identifies as a dramaturg, raise your hand. So we do that. And then starts asking questions and says, if this doesn't apply to you, just put your hand down. So asking questions like, how many of you feel comfortable dramaturging a new musical? Like, asking a bunch of questions. By the time she was done asking these questions, there were two hands left in that space. And, and really what, the, what, what happened is that there was a real understanding by the end of that, that this person did not have the dramaturg for them in that space. So of course that relationship was not going to go well because this person needed skill sets, needed all sorts of things that this person that they were working with did not have. And I think it actually has to be, if any theater is interested in new play development, you are doing nothing but harming, and I mean that in all senses of the word, everyone in that space, if you're not willing to put the resources behind it to do it well. Because what, do you, what, what story are you going to get? You're going to get a story of duress <laughs> and how like everything happened at a cost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and, and I'm not saying that it always has to be fiscal, but just take the time. Ask the questions. Get the people in the room that are going to help serve the purposes of that play. And if you do that, you will already be doing the best you can to tell the best story that playwright wrote. And I'm done. Off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add to that to say that from the perspective of a potential, you know, I'm assuming people listening to this want to be dramaturgs or whatever. And so if you're not planning on being somebody who's running an institution, it's really okay to step back from a conversation that you don't feel like you have anything to contribute to and you know I, I th there's always a lot of pressure also to get your voice in there and make uh, you know prove yourself or whatever it is but ultimately it is in service of the play and you need to just be comfortable doing what's best for that and you know so there's a level of personal responsibility for sure oh that was bradley by the way sorry did you get it before yet? um this is Salisa. I, I also wanted to use an example from way back in the day. So when I when I started 
like I, I think of myself as the chick in the band situation, right? We're really equitable. Look, there's a woman in an artistic staff meeting. <laughs> and, and when I started, I was usually the youngest person in the room as well, right? So, th so I was like, okay, I'm the one woman in the room and I'm a lot younger than everyone else. And I've kind of been hired because I'm easy to get along with. Okay, I get it. I see the I see what the drill is. I get I get it. Okay. All right. We got it. Okay. And I was really lucky to to play that role with some really amazing, nurturing, incredible people. Uh, you know. So it was it was fine. I work with all women now though. Mm -hmm. I think it's you know, I think that's not an accident. Like at a certain point I was like, Ugh. Ugh. Um, you know, that's that's too bad. I like working with men. But like, mm -hmm. you know, where you start, like where you where the industry is when you start, you know, ling it lingers. Um but I remember this seismic shift when all of a sudden male playwrights were demanding fiercely women directors mm. to work on their world premieres. And it happened It happened in the late 90s, early 2000s. And now women dominate the new play industry. But I heard from the, the, the uh, there was a really amazing playwright uh, at the Alliance who asked for this. And he said, I don't want someone who's like me. And I don't want to take care of another guy. And I will take care of another guy if there's a guy in the room. And he, he was like, I know this is very gendered and this is very sexist. But if I am surrounded by women, I know I'm going to be well taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I know my play is going to be well taken care of. And I was like, okay, there are so many gender assumptions right here. <laughs> but also at the same like at the same time, this was not this was not an um, isolated conversation. And also suddenly, all my female directing friends who were really good at new plays like that hadn't changed. Like they were doing new plays in New York. Like all you know, we were all running around. And you know they went from I can't get hired to I do not have 30 seconds in my dance card because I am um, like there was a shift, and it was from selfishness and gender stereotypes, but also it was about who has been struggling to do the work with writers in a peer relationship, and who like who w who is interested in real collaboration and who is going to be someone that I can work with where I don't have to for I don't have to worry about gendered behavior because I just want to work on my play. I don't want to work on the and then a lot of women started asking for women to direct their world premieres and now a lot of women direct world premieres all the time. Like but I've seen it ha it happened in like 5 or 6 years. So it really it can be good that like really that question of what do you need and what do you want can sometimes have if it can feel like a selfish question or it can get sometimes into like who has real power in the room but that is how change happens those questions actually if they're on if they're asked with intention and they're answered honestly that is how the profession changes and keeps being really dynamic and keeps being authentic This is Anna again, thank you. And this is my last question before we, we open up. Uh, I think I wanna go back to the question of education that Martine raised. And, um, and uh, one of you mentioned also the question of skill set, right? So um, when you think about uh, skill sets that dramaturgs must have for new play development, is it enough for us to think about just, you know, um, analyzing structure and know a lot of, you know, content and uh, you know, cultural context and um, interpos interpersonal relations? Or should we think about a training that also includes intercultural competency? Would that something be, be necessary? Would that be something valuable in your opinion? I think it would be valuable, but, oh, this is Bradley, by the way. I think it would be valuable. This is really hard for me to speak to because, like I said, I never trained as a dramaturg or anything. I've never studied theater. Um, so I don't n even know what the process is currently like, to be honest. But, I mean... I don't know. I, I like. I, I feel that there's so. 
there's just such a slew of different stories, so many different people's experiences, so many different people to work with. I truly believe that the best way of developing a sense of intercultural competency is through interacting with playwrights who are writing from a different perspective and working on their work and really being active about just listening, hearing what people are saying and learning throughout the process. I mean, I am certainly still learning how to do this and I feel like the education part of it never ends and you can always get better at, at that. Um. This is Martine, educator. <laughs> it's interesting that you asked this question because I think the answer is quite simply yes. Mm -hmm. And and the the reason why I say that is because I feel like in some ways dramaturgs are also brilliant uh chameleons in spaces. They can help talk about plays, what's happening in the plays, the world of the play, and some of the most amazingly beautiful ways that like you know, span all sorts of audiences. And the only way that they can truly do that is if they do have intercultural, transcultural, like all sorts of different kinds of like cultural competency trainings. And that is something that was really important to me when I was running the dramaturgy program at SUNY New Paltz. Mm -hmm. And it's still something important to me now. Like when I bring students into spaces, you know, I'm always looking for opportunities to bring uh, BIPOC students into the space, but I'm also here for like my white students too, like, you know, Camille came in, Camille is n does not identify as black, but helped us tell an all black story on Tony Stone. And, and one of the things that Camille actually said coming out of that space was that they learned a lot about what storytelling is by being in a space full of people that do, does not look like her. Because there are some cultural differences in the way that people go about storytelling. And this gets back into the questions about structure. Like, we have a tendency to privilege Eurocentric cultures in terms of how we think about structure and what they should be. And so let's get out of that by asking people to do other things. And it's cool and it's great. And, like, you learn something new. And, yay, that's what we're supposed to be doing as dramaturgs. But then in the same way, at the same time where there's that's important, I also, you know, Forced is a very strong word, but I, I, you know, highly encouraged by the way that I structured my curriculum to make sure that students were taking things outside of the theater school, like outside of my school. They needed to take philosophy classes. They needed to take like an Asian literature class. They needed to take this. They needed to take that because get the ham and cheese sandwich out of this building mm -hmm. because the stories we tell are outside of the building. So anyway. I get all passionate about this because, like, I really feel that we have to be preparing our students in the best way possible. And, yes, the techniques and all those things are super-duper important, but also just living life and learning generally what is happening outside the theater is the best way to come at being a new play dramaturg. Just saying. Finn. <laughs> so I just want to piggyback on what – what Martine is saying, I would say vital, um, necessary, important, and having them the humility to say theater training doesn't actually know how to do it. And you have to look at other disciplines. Um, like Synchronicity Theater is in a residency right now. Is an ex her name is Phyllis, Phyllis Braxton. She's brilliant. Read her book. She's just getting published on Amazon. Uh, but she's a specialist in intercultural conflict and communication. And we found her through the IV IDI Inventory, which is a group based out of Maryland. And um, and she knows she is an expert at intercultural awareness and conflict and rules and measures and training, and it's something you can get better at. Like it's not it's not about is about living yes, but it's not like oh I've been graced with this awareness to be more woke and no like there 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 is there is training that you can do that is that is not all that expensive or all that hard. And it's difficult because you have to live it every single day. But, and then I think, um, again, to, to your point, get out of the theater building and live life. And a great training is to say, what is it, what is it, what in this town, what is a, what is an experience that I'm not super familiar with? I'm going to go make myself do it. Like, you know, for me, it's like going to a sporting event. I feel massively uncomfortable. But sometimes I just, now that I live in Atlanta, I make myself go. And I, you know. Yeah, or I made myself go to the I, Yankee game. That was really fun, actually. But it, like that used to make me physically very uncomfortable. But I thought I can't, I can't be an American dramaturg and not go to major sporting events. That's to be, that's completely limiting 
my access to the culture that I'm trying to be a dramaturg in. And it's really elitist and really snobby. So, you know, like just a li- you know, humility. And that's like a really dumb example, but it was a really good example for me personally. What's the thing that scares you? Because um, great theater artists, so many great theater artists talk about, I work on the things that scare me. Mm-hmm. So if you if you think about that, and not scary like I'm going to be hurt physically, but what you know, what are what are the things that, that scare you? But it's it's a muscle, it's a discipline, it's a sociological discipline, it's an academic discipline, it's one that if one strives to get better, there are resources in the world and with the internet that you can find really easily to practice those muscles. Susanna, uh, I'm going to open to questions. If anybody would like to ask a question to the panelists. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Hi, it's Lexi again. Um, So I wanted to ask all of you. What the best advice that a trusted mentor ever gave you um, on the industry or beyond, if it's something that still serves you every day? Something that was really meaningful to me, um, this was said to me by, this is super general, but I feel like it's worth hearing, especially for younger people just getting into the, the fold of this all. A really good mentor of mine, uh, Mariah Aitken, who is a director and actress um, who I worked with a lot early in my career, like assisting her when she was directing projects. I remember one time I said something to the effect of like, oh, like I had an idea about the show and she was like, why didn't you say that? And I was like, oh, I didn't think anybody wanted to hear that. And she was she was just very adamant about saying your voice is valued in this space and you're good at what you're doing and you need to just speak out when you have these thoughts. And I feel like that invitation was really important for me to just feel comfortable like being there and like that you know that you are your voice is part of the equation and so that invitation won't always come but I feel like it's good to operate under that thought not just you know flagrantly saying anything that comes to your head but feeling like fundamentally theater is a collaborative process and it's not like a lot of other art forms because it doesn't exist without a whole group of people working together to do something so if you're there I just encourage you to make your voice heard and everybody's specific perspective can contribute to a process and yeah um um so when I was living in Prague in 1993 I was working at the at a really great theater with this amazing like Czech film and tv star and one day in rehearsal she said Salisa um, you're going to come with me to the drag show on the boat. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> and she said, because you're American and you will understand how important it is that we can do drag in Prague. Mm-hmm. And I want you to see it. I haven't been to a drag show ever. But Susanna needed me to be the American expert on drag to see what was an incredible and seismic shift in the artistic, political, and social justice life of Prague. And then it changed my DNA to be on the boat that night because everyone there wasn't be pro- being progressive or woke or gay-friendly or anything. They were like, we have survived communism, and now we get to have drag shows on a boat in Prague because the world is spinning forward, and no one is going to take our drag shows away and I thought, I'm not actually the person, <laughs> I'm so not the person Susanna needs me to be in this moment, but maybe if I will live my, right, my life right, I will live up to what she thinks that I'm doing. So I think when you find people who expect more of you than you could ever dream of for yourself, keep them close, remember it, and walk in the path that they are laying out for you. Or sometimes I say when I'm teaching is, listen to the world. This is Martine. So I'm going to start with a bit of a word, well, testimony, in the sense that uh, one of the things that I have learned over the course of my years on this planet is that mentoring never stops. 
So one, there are people that I'm about to give a quick shout out to who have been a part of my life for over 20 years and are just are there for me even now. Like I had a little bit of a crisis of faith a little while ago and called one of these people and this person has been in my life since grad school. And like it's one of those things where, you know, mentoring never stops. And I hope that I can be for former students the same that person that they are for me now. So one. So one, uh, trusted mentor Sally Shedd at Virginia Wesleyan College because she was the one that looked at me and said, you have the soul of a dramaturg. Mm -hmm. I was young. I had no idea what the ham and cheese sandwich a dramaturg was and was like, I need you, I need uh, some splaining, please. What is that? And then she said what it was. And I, I am not kidding. It was like the heavens had opened up. Ca angels had come down and like man, it started raining from heaven. Because I was like, that's a thing that I can do? Like, and wait, what? That's a thing. I want that. All of that. Can I have all of it? And like really worked with me in that like the curriculum at the school that I was attending at, at Virginia Wesleyan was a little different at that point, And there was no real like dramaturgy track. But she, but she was like, if this is what you want to do, we are going to figure this out and we're going to shift some stuff around and we're going to sub some stuff out and we're going to set you on a path. So like a hey, shout out to Sally. Also, same thing with like I call them the Patricks, Patrick Tuit and Patrick Sims. And the thing that they one of them was my uh, master's degree advisor. The other one was uh, an advisor for me during my Ph.D. program. And the thing that they both taught me, which is the main sort of takeaway that I want to share with everyone, is that they basically through their actions, the way they lived their lives and what they tried to instill in me my takeaway was that you never compromise your integrity, your identity, and your morals because it's just theater. Like, those are the, those are the only things you have in an industry that is going to try and shake all of those things, take them away from you, shake them out of you, all those things. Never do it. Like, and they taught me that it is okay to say no and to walk the ham and cheese sandwich away. And that is, like, the best gift anyone can ever truly give you is to remind you you actually have agency. You know what I'm saying? All right, I'm done. <laughs> Hi. Um, this is Eric Mayor Garcia, assistant professor. Indiana University in Wilmington, um, he, him, pronouns. And I was just wondering, how has um, COVID era, the virtual Zoom, has that impacted your um, work with dramaturgs or dramaturgs work as you've seen it? How has it over the last year? Thank you for that question. This is Martine. So here's the weird thing about my journey I was busier during the pandemic than I was before the pandemic, which is like the weirdest thing ever to say. But part of part of what I think happened is that there were a lot of places. So there are two things that you should know about me as a dramaturg. Number one, I, I live on the fringes in the sense that I love me some digiturgy. And the way I'm defining digiturgy is how dramaturgs interact with technology, but then also how we interact with storytelling in terms of that and so because I was living in that weird fringe land anyway like all of a sudden the pandemic happened people were shifting to zoom and all other forms of like um sort of filmed storytelling and that like I was able to just shine my light just shined because I was like yes here we go the world is ready for me <laughs> um but uh, so but then also what ended up happening is I think there were a lot of theaters that didn't have uh something else to do quote unquote for a while besides develop new plays they're like, well, we can't put anything on a stage, but we do. We still have all these actors, and we still have all these things, so we might as well just go ahead and do the thing that we'd either started contracting people to do, or like, let's do that. And so I found myself so much busier than I had been before that, which was really weird. I think I had maybe like a whole month and a half where I was like, oh, what am I going to do with myself? Like, this is weird. And then, and then it just got busier, and it stayed busy ever since then, which is really, really strange and weird. Um, so American theater has been hemorrhaging playwrights um, since Netflix discovered streaming in a way that is, frankly, as a new play professional, disgraceful. It is disgraceful that a generation of writers has found more success and welcome. Um, and while I am so happy that these writers I love are making media money, um, that it is not accompanied by the theaters that love them making, you know, filling up their inboxes with 
pleased for plays is really something I think the American theater has to grapple with. Um, and, and I live in Atlanta where we produce, like it, Atlanta actually hasn't done that with its playwrights. Like the playwrights who come out of Atlanta, Atlanta who write for TV, I'm thinking about Toph of Pain, Lauren Gunderson, Steve Yaki is very, like, he doesn't live in Atlanta p anymore, but he will always be an Atlantan for us. You know, they have homes. Like, they have homes. If Steve Yaki writes a play, Actors Express is going to do it. Like, that, right? It's like not, it's, you know, he, he, yeah. But that's not true in a lot of places, that, that feeling of your home is the theater. Um, and I think that because playwrights are resilient and it is the age of the playwright and playwrights are amazing, as they often do, they took the pandemic and they wrote like maniacs and they kept everybody busy. And now the wealth of playwriting, that's the one thing that didn't go away. Producing went away, audiences went away, directors went away, everything went away. But the playwrights were clogging up everybody's inboxes. So now it's up to the producing theaters to get their acts together because otherwise all these new plays that Martine was talking about will be filmed and they will be Netflix miniseries. And we will have to live with that again. Hello, uh, Diana Grisanti. I'm a playwright. Um, she, her pronouns. I'm a white person, blue eyes, brown hair, glasses. Um, this is kind of going off what you said, Salisa, and this is something that I've been mulling over. Uh, this is a general question about artists, but also playwrights and dramaturgs in particular. How do we create, to like quote politicians, a thriving middle class for artists? Because it is so much feast or, feast or famine. So like, how do we as an industry do that? Um, I mean, that's a huge question, and I, I don't know, I, I don't feel fully equipped to answer that, but what I will say is that there are places in this country where that's more possible to happen currently and places where it's not as possible, and I, oh, whenever I talk to young people who are trying to get into theater who have dreams of going to New York, I really want them to have a realistic idea of what that is like and also to understand not just how hard that is, but once you understand how hard that is and how I almost impossible it is to really make a living, how comparatively easy it is to do it in other places where they are still doing fantastic, amazing work. Like Houston, for example, is a place where, you know, b before this job at the Alley, I was working on commercial theater in New York, working on Broadway shows. And I can honestly say that whenever I've worked in regional theater, it's been so much nicer for the artists, for the staff than it ever was in New York, even though it doesn't have the same level of prestige. And fundamentally, y at a lot of these great theaters around the country, you're working with literally the same artists that work in New York too. So I think it's also about reframing the mindset of like what it means to be a successful theater artist, where you can do that. And I hope that more people have that realization so that I'm, I want more great artists and writers to be in Houston. That would be so, so great. And uh, whenever I talk to people coming out of these programs, I try to tell them like, it's a really nice city. You can get your work done. We'd support a lot of new work. And, you know, so I'm hoping to see that shift. And I think it will naturally just happen just because it's becoming so unaffordable to live in like New York City or in LA or whatever it is. And so I'm thinking it's just gonna happen, but we'll, we'll see. Thank you. To, this is Martine, to add on to that. I forgot to say my name. I'm sorry, that was Bradley. <laughs> so this is Martine. I think to add on to what Bradley just said, I think honestly, and I hate to be so redactive about it, or re not redactive, reductive about it, but we need more, artists need governmental support. And not in that really messed up way where like what happened with the NEA four like we we're not like none of that like actually just let artists make art, and like help pay them for it because I think one of the most atrocious things honestly that I am still reeling from that happened during the pandemic is the fact that when everyone retreated into their houses because they had to, what did they start looking to in order to, they they started looking to all or art forms to entertain themselves yet no one wants to give money to the arts. And I'm like, what the hammage, like back to what the hammage is, like what, what, what the what? And so, <laughs> and so, I mean, I think, you know, I know people are like, there are probably somebody watching this right now who's clutching their, their pocketbook and being like, ah, oh, they're coming after me with taxes. But we kind of need that to happen, honestly and truly, because the only way we're going to really create a thriving middle class is that we actually support artists and the only way that's going to happen because like i love chicago theater let's just be real like there's a lot of stuff going on there and it also is one of the worst paying markets i've ever lived in like it pays so terribly that like part of me also feels like some of these places should be ashamed of themselves but i also get it like if they're not if the money's not coming in there's no money to give 
So like, let's help bring some money in. And more than likely, the only place where that's really going to start and really going to happen is that if it comes from local, regional, state, federal governments. Back off soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when the chips were down in the pandemic, the federal government passed the employee retention credit. And I've, I worked on all the pandemic relief programs and all of them are going to contribute to an earlier denies for me except the ERC credits which were a pain sort of but they were rewarding you for uh, employee retention and sorry Salisa being a management wonk but um so the employee retention credit was applied to any any business that was affected by the pandemic and it reimbursed you for keeping your staff so you got the the salaries back for 70 percent of your staff and if there's some kind of equally enlightened um, program in the world of tax credits, well, most of us nonprofits don't pay taxes, but you got you got the money reimbursed. So you you the government led you to do what it wanted you to do, which is to keep people employed, and then it paid you back a percentage of the salary. And if government funding can move away from project support, which theater people will do bake sales and sell kidneys to do, and move into infrastructural support, and then another of my soapbox, just make healthcare universal mm -hmm. <laughs> and invest in education. But that's, you know, larger. But just for, if you registered or not, wouldn't it be great if you registered as a non-for-profit theater and kept your status intact and had a 501c3 and were around for five years that you would be eligible to reimburse 40% of your staff costs? And, and that they had to be making X amount of money to get this, and your staff had to, and it had to be full-time, or it had to be three-fourths time. Like something very real, and then you get the money back. So that, that, and that, and then knowing theaters, all that money that they get back would go to pay actors. I mean, that's how we all are. Like theater artists are always wanting to pay the artists to do art or pay themselves. But if there was some kind of government program that rewarded infrastructure, I think that would be huge. And what I learned from my time in Prague, which was right after, you know, it was the early 90s, is that if you as a society commit to an atmosphere of change, change can happen. And it's, it's here. And we saw it during the pandemic. Like the ERC credit is size, if, if we had actually as Americans actually talked about it or thought about it, it would never have gone through. It just had to happen or the economy was going to fall apart, right? So if there's some plan that has equal energy of if we don't happen, th have this happen, the arts economy will fall apart. And if we do have it happen, the arts economy will grow. And it has to be big. And it has to be not, it has to be like every 501c arts organization that meets certain criteria that is mostly economic. Not are you, do you have this agenda or that agenda or you blah, blah, blah. Are you, you know, it just has to be legal definitions. Uh, or maybe like a percentage of your budget has to be spent on education. That would really make sense. That would really be helpful. That would be great. Everyone would have great thriving education programs. So, okay, that's, hmm. that's my soapbox. But in a way, not project funding. Project funding makes people feel really good. But you know who will raise money <laughs> for projects? Arts organizations. Like if all I had to do is raise money for arts programs, I would be such a happy managing. Like if I knew that our staff and real estate and benefits were taken care of or have taken care of, and I could run around Atlanta raising money to pay playwrights and actors, my job would be so much easier and we would make so much art. Because that's very, people like people and corporations and local entities want that to happen. But no one wants to pay the air conditioning bill. But let me tell you, if you're making theater in Atlanta, Georgia, <laughs> the air conditioning bill is a very high priority or the art is not happening. Right. Well, I, and the, the sort of last thing I want to add to that that I think is super important uh, to, to really actually wrap our brain around is that it also isn't necessarily productive for artists to be flopping from project to project to project. Because then sometimes these projects aren't necessarily being done because those are the projects the artists want to do. That's what they could get the funding to do, which is not the same thing. And so, like, you're in the, so then you're spending all this time on something that's not really speaking to your heart or to the zeitgeist or to any of these things. And so I think 
you know, it's always like, I'm that person. Like I actually have one of those, I have a goal list for myself of things that I want to do. And like on, on that list is to be a donor who gives money and just lets artists make their art. No restrictions. You do you boo. Like <laughs> That is the kind of donor that I, I am at this moment and that I'm trying to be, especially as I'm starting to like somehow manage to like, I don't even know how I managed to do this, but like uh, and now I have some spare change, in my, like some spare change in my pocket, mostly because I don't think I have to pay my student loans until what, August. But like <laughs> in the meantime, I'm like, OK, let me let me actually just give unrestricted money to artists. So anyway, yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Eleanor Wiki. she, her. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Theater and Dance at IU. Um, this is also kind of a question about institutional structures, but from a little less financial perspective. Um, thinking about the kind of historical problems that have existed with the pipeline in terms of getting new works into full production, I'm interested if there are any particular changes you have seen, things that individual institutions are doing that have excited you in terms of, you know, finding, selecting new plays, rethinking how workshops and readings function, anything like that. Um, so I used to run the Candida National Graduate p uh, Playwriting Competition at the Alliance Theater, which is the brainchild of Susan Booth. And she asked that question. So one, I think you should never use the words problems and pi new work pipeline in the same sentence. Like, don't talk about it. Don't give our precious time and energy to people who do it badly. Only talk about all the amazing places that do it really well. And then it, the funding will follow, right? But Susan just said we're not, you know, she wanted to create a really strong pipeline to produce work of people coming out of um, graduate school, which was not appropriate for every institution, was definitely appropriate for the Alliance, addressing all kinds of concerns, including a lack of um, graduate playwright training in the Southeast. So, the, And Atlanta needs people, like Houston. Atlanta needs people. If you're an artist and you have some training, move to Atlanta, Georgia, please. We need you. We need you. We'll make you work really hard and love you to pieces. And the food is really good. Um, so yeah um so we you know we committed to a production and at first it didn't sell then it sold really well and i think the play like i was really moved um by something terrell mcqueeny said when he won so his career was blowing up right and he but he said when he was the winner he said at every other theater i am an exception i am a gay artist of color who got a shot and there's a lot of subtext there about gratitude and about we're taking a chance. And he didn't belabor the subtext, but we could hear the subtext. And he said, at the Alliance Theater, I'm the winner of the Candida National Graduate Playwriting Competition. And there are, there are winners before me, and there are winners after me. And I have a job. And that job is actually articulated. So like there were we, and we were still kind of figuring out what it was, but what we, at the time, what we asked the Candida winner to do was to talk to us about marketing and talk to us about their vision of new audiences. And it was a great place to try things, and it was a very well-funded, um, generous program. So it was not like every year was not the potential last year, right? Because it was a prior, it was an institu you know, it was a, it was a pipeline program that was an institutional priority of the artistic director. Which gets back to celebrate the pipelines that are working because there are a lot of them and they're working really well. I'm covering. This is Martine. I'm covering so Bradley can come back and have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. I had to leave the room. I have a small bladder. It's actually medical. <laughs> it's not. I'm not just like oh, I have a small bladder. <laughs> I went to a doctor. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, okay. Fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, sorry. What was the question? About pipelines. Like you were talking oh. about everything in the alley. And like what are alley influences? Pipelines for new plays. Oh, so the alley has a really robust um, new work initiative, which is great. Um, there's there's a lot of different ways to enter into it. Um, the most obvious, I guess, pathway is through our Alley All New Festival, which is a new play festival that we have every year. And it's coming up this June, June 15th through 25th everyone should come it's really fun <laughs> um, and so that's a festival where we present around eight pieces in varying stages of development um, we do two workshops which basically are like four week rehearsal processes that lead up to a very quickly staged version of a new play 
we do four readings which are just you know stage you know just normal readings with uh, music stands whatever and then we do two what we call early draft previews which are a chance for an artist to just go talk about their work present scenes from it or something like that um and all of these plays are plays th they may have had some developmental work but they're all plays that have never been produced fully at any um theater so that's a really um fun part of the process for me because we're much more open-ended on what we can do for the festival compared to what we can do in the season because it is a free event that is just funded by the theater and it's open to the public and we have a r actually a growing and nicely robust um, new work audience in Houston too so it's really fun to hear their feedback and yeah we can we can do all different types of stuff so no, we haven't announced the stuff yet for this year so I don't want to spoil anything but like we're able to show for example um, a, like a type of work for example, one of the artists we're bringing in is an experimental theater artist who works in a process that is very different from what we usually are accommodate in the American theater. Um, she's a collaborative artist that writes with a group, is very movement-based. There's no script really to speak of, or there is, but it's kind of a basic blueprint. And so I'm really proud that we were able to give an artist like that uh, a platform to create it in a major theater institution where it can be seen by different you know by anyone who comes um and then on top of that we also the alley commissions a ton of work um from writers and we try to put an emphasis on houston or i mean texas-based writers um just to keep that pool growing and to tell those stories and it's a kind of an underrepresented group within the playwriting world at large although there are a lot of great playwrights from texas and um, ut austin has a really good program and a lot of good writers come out of there um there's tons of there's tons of um there's tons of great um writers from El Paso that I've I've recently started working with and so yeah it's it's really really exciting and then I mean we're lucky to be an institution that has a lot of resources and a lot of space because it's Houston I mean if you've never been to the alley it is unbelievable how much physical room there is in that building like not just the theater spaces themselves but like you know we have our own scene shop and all this it is truly truly massive i've never seen anything like that so we have all these spaces where like you can you know if somebody wants to do like a little reading or something or, or we're working with a play a local playwright and they need time to develop we have the resources to be able to just like open up a room and we have a resident acting company so they can work with them to develop the show and and there are a lot of other uh, cultural institutions within Houston that the alley also works with so even if we can't produce a show for whatever reason there's a lot of other avenues that we can help shepherd new work towards um, I'm actually super excited because we just discovered a new one of those which is um, the Moody Center uh, which is part of Rice University um, has a beautiful performance space and it's more of like an, a fine art building and the the woman who runs it um, you know, she's just, she's more in the fine art world, so she doesn't have, like, resources. So we've been so happy because this is a new great space that has a production manager and everything and a s shop that they can make stuff. And uh, we we are talking about trying to shepherd some of the stuff from the Alley New Festival into that space so that we can help people in Houston to see it. And they also do uh, completely free performances. So I'm super excited about that, too. Um, yeah, that's, bas that's a basic overview of it. Um, it's a great place. If anyone has new plays that they want to be considered for the festival, email them to me. I read them all the time. <laughs> Y'all heard that. Email. <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> this is Martine. Uh, I'm going to reframe the question just a little bit because what I want to talk about are the things that are super exciting to me that I want to see more of. And so if anybody is like anybody out there who's a producer who's interested, I'm your dramaturg. <laughs> but what I'm really interested in is like the new play development that happens in the immersive world and the AR VR world and like how we are using AR VR to supplement what is happening in theater spaces. That is the new frontier in terms of storytelling. And I am here for every single second of it. Like, uh, have you ever seen an immersive script? I mean, those things are like 400 pages deep because you have to have like all of the different iterations that could potentially happen. And I mean, that is like the best, um, like, and I think in some ways because my brain as a dramaturg is very sort of puzzle oriented in some ways, like that kind of dramaturgy is the, that is the ish for me. <laughs> like I want to be all up in that. Um, and then also just because I'm, um, you know, back to the AR VR stuff, I'm really just interested in how we start to think about, you know, expanding, like, you know how there's like that saying that the, 
the performance begins in the lobby or like that kind of stuff. I want to expand it even further out. Can it ex- can it start in my house? If I happen to have an Oculus set or can it start in my house, even if I just have my computer in front of me or my phone or whatever? Like, what are the things that we could be doing to really actually start supplementing the storytelling experience long before someone even steps into the theater? Because, I mean, I think that's also part of what we have to do. We have to start enticing people back into our physical spaces. And the only way we're going to do that is by meeting them where they are. And everyone's gotten and I ain't mad at them because, like. My introvert itself was living my best life during the pandemic. And so, like, you <laughs> you have to basically, like, get, meet people where they are, which is in their houses, and say, hey, hey, boo, hey, come look at this moisturized ankle that I'm showing you right now, which is the beginning of, like, our storytelling experience, and come on over here, baby. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, anyway, that was a lot. Oh, I, that's just my thing when I, you know, like, you know, if you're showing somebody some ankle, like that's, that's what I always say. Like when I go fundraising, I always tell my students that I'm about to go show some moisturized ankle in order to get some stuff in the building. <laughs> it, it's just a running joke. Yeah. Hi, this is Anna. Thank you so much. We're running out of time. I want to be mindful of the interpreter's time too. Uh, I want to thank everybody that came in person, audience, guests, everybody, in uh, students, interpreters, and I hope you had a great time, and thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.